Welcome back everyone. And this is the video on synthesis components, otherwise known as unit generators. I'm gonna do this video in a slightly different way. Instead of having some PowerPoint slides, I have the Super Collider programming environment in front of me. And I'm gonna use this to demonstrate some of the basic synthesis components or unit generators. But the focus in this video is not gonna be on the Super Collider code. It's really gonna be on just demonstrating these basic synthesis components, what they sound like, uh, how they work, um, and uh, a few other things about them. So over here on the right, I have a frequency analyzer and we'll see it in action in a second when we make sound signals, it will give us a real-time indication of how those sound signals are distributed across the audible spectrum with increasing energy being higher up from the bottom to the top and increasing frequency being um, further to the right and lower frequencies being further to the left. So the very first synthesis component or unit generator that we need to know about is the oscillator. And oscillators are unit generators that produce a regular repeating shape of waveform. So I'm gonna make a sine wave here as a demonstration, a very slow sine wave. And if we look down here, what we're seeing is a visualization of how this wave moves up and down. We've talked about the sine wave already. What we're seeing here again is that this sine wave is moving up and down in a smooth curve. And this particular sine wave is moving up and down one times per second, which is below the threshold of human hearing, so we don't hear it as a tone. But if I stop that one and I play this one, which is at 440 hertz instead, we hear a steady, pure tone. And although the visualization isn't perfect, we can kind of see the shape of the curve here on the stethoscope. And if we look up at the frequency analyzer, what we see is a single mountain peak, kind of around that 440 hertz zone. And so we learn a couple things from that. I think we, we learn the, the sound of the sine wave, but we also see that it's, it's a waveform that has energy at exactly one part of the spectrum. And that part of the spectrum is the, the spectrum of its fundamental frequency. So this sine wave shape that we just heard was repeating 440 times per second. Because that shape was repeating 440 times per second, in the spectrum there is energy at around 440 hertz. The sine wave is the only oscillator that has that characteristic, that it puts energy at only one place in the spectrum. Every other shape will put energy at multiple places in the spectrum. So let's move to an example of another shape, the sawtooth or saw wave. Now this is a shape that goes quickly up and then gradually decays away in a straight line. And it looks like this. Actually, other way around. It slowly rises up and then falls off very quickly. So it goes from its lowest point in a straight line up to its highest point, and then it falls back down to its lowest point again. So there's no curve, and there's also a very sudden transition when it goes back from the highest point to the lowest point. And what we're seeing is this happening one times per second. We're getting a bit of a, all we're hearing is a click when it goes back down. But this is what it sounds like if we do this shape 444 times per second. And if you look in the frequency analyzer, what you see is some energy around 440 hertz, but then you see energy at all these other frequencies as well. And it happens to be the case that these other frequencies are multiples of 440. So this is 440, this is 880, this is 440 more than that, and 440 more than that, and so on. And if we weren't working with a computer system, a digital audio system that can only represent frequencies up to half the sampling rate, 
our, saw, our perfect sawtooth wave would be producing energies at multiples of its fundamental frequency all the way up to infinite frequency. Um, but perhaps before we move on from this sawtooth wave, we should observe the comparison with the sine, to the sine wave. Here's the sine wave again, that pure sound, energy at just one part in the spectrum. Here's this sawtooth wave at the same frequency. And we can see it's got energy all the way up the spectrum, and it's also a much brighter sound as a result of that. So now is the time to talk briefly about band-limited oscillators. The sawtooth wave that we just looked at has energy at multiples of its fundamental frequency all the way up to infinite frequency. But our digital audio systems can only represent frequencies up to half the sampling rate, the Nyquist frequency. We learned that in our digital audio um, and sampling theory module. So for that reason, with the exception of the sine wave, all the other shapes can be made in band limited versions where some math has been done, they've been given not quite the perfect shape so that the energy doesn't go above that Nyquist frequency, half of the sampling rate. So here is, here's a one hertz sawtooth wave. And if you're looking at what's happening over here in the stethoscope, you're probably seeing a somewhat curvier shape compared to what we saw before. The shape has been altered slightly from the perfect sawtooth wave so that it has this band limited characteristic. And if we listen to it, so up at 440 Hertz, it sounds like this. So that's our band limited one. Let's go back to compare it to the, to the non band limited one. And here's the band limited one. And it's a subtle difference, but if you go back and forth between those two things, I think when you listen to the non-band limited one, you'll start to hear a kind of um, strange artificial or metallic sound. And what that, what that is, it's, it's the energy from those frequencies that are above the Nyquist frequency folding over and becoming strange, very quietly present low frequencies. So band limit oscillators don't have that problem because they've been designed their shape has been designed in a way that they don't produce energy above the Nyquist frequency. And the long and short of it is, is that as you move them through different frequencies, they're really gonna sound um, more pure and not, they're not gonna introduce those same little artificial digital sounds that we might get from the non-band limited versions of them. So there are other shapes. Um, for example, we can have things like square waves and triangle waves. Um, but we'll leave those to explore in another context. Suffice it to say that oscillators are these unit generators that produce a regular repeating shape forever and ever and ever, uh, or until we stop them in some way. But what we can do with those shapes is connect them with other things, combine them with each other, so on and so forth, to get interesting sounds. So another generator that we can deal with is the noise generator. Um, and there's two types of noise generator I want to talk about, the white noise generator and the pink noise generator. White noise sounds like this. We've all heard this before. Um, it's the sound of radio static or television static. And if we look at the display of the waveform, it just looks kind of like a squiggly line that's moving all over the place completely randomly. And that's what it is. It's just randomly picking values from sample to sample. And if we look at it in the spectrum analyzer, um, and we have a little bit of imagination, what we're seeing here is basically a straight line. And indeed, that's one of the characteristics of white noise is that it has equal energy as we go up through the spectrum. And we can contrast that with pink noise, which sounds like this. Oh, I'm gonna change that so it goes to both speakers. Here we go. Pink noise sounds like this. Sounds darker. You might notice that right away. And the reason it sounds darker is because with pink noise, it has equal energy in each octave. In other words, every time the frequency doubles, there's the same amount of energy. 
So between zero and 100 hertz is a certain amount of energy. Then between, you know, that and 200 hertz is the same amount of energy. Between 200 and 400, there's the same amount of energy. 400 and 800, the same amount of energy. 800 and 1600, the same amount of energy. So one of the things that hap is happening is that the same amount of energy is being spread over larger areas as we go up through the spectrum. And that's why you see less and less energy as you go up through the spectrum on this analyzer here. And as a result, it sounds darker than white noise, which has much more energy in the, fri in the high frequency part of the spectrum. So um, noise is, is probably not so useful by itself. Our oscillators are not so useful by themselves either. Um, so the unit generators we're going to introduce now are things that we might use together with oscillators or noise generators um, to, to, to carve out in various ways the sounds that we want. So let's talk briefly about filters. We're only going to talk about them briefly because we've already been using filters in earlier modules in the class. But when we start to use filters, which increase or decrease the presence of uh, a range of frequencies in the spectrum in a signal, when we start to use those filters with synthesis, some different possibilities start to emerge that we're less likely to explore if we're just working with the filters um, in that standard way we do in a digital audio workstation. So in this next example, what I've done is I've started with pink noise that we just heard, started with this. And I've put a filter on it that emphasizes just the frequencies around a very, very narrow range of the spectrum, just the frequencies around 440 hertz. And I've cut away all of the other frequencies from the noise and then increased the level of it so that we can hear it again. And it sounds like this. It has a kind of whistling sound to it. We can hear the pitch, which is the same pitch we were hearing in our oscillator examples earlier, but has a whistly, windy sound to it, the sound of filtered noise. And this can be kind of fun, and I think this is an, in the next example I'm, I'm doing one of those things I mentioned in another module and in another lecture, where we said that if we did synthesis with a programming environment, things might be more scalable than they otherwise would be. And basically I've just taken the code from the line before and I've added some extra numbers to it. And what I'm going to get now is a chord, multiple pitches of filtered noise. And it sounds like this. It's kind of pleasant, whistly sound that goes on forever. And if we look at it in the frequency analyzer, we can see that it definitely has a concentration around the frequencies that we're filtering around. But it has energy that rolls off to either side of it. There's, more, there's energy that decreases as we go away to the left and energy that decreases as we go away to the right. So when we use noise generators together with filters, we get something that in some ways is a little bit like an oscillator in that it's got a certain pattern of energy in the, in the spectrum that it can make indefinitely. So another way we can carve away at these sounds to make them interesting is to carve away at them in time. And that's what envelopes are for. And the basic idea of an envelope is that we make the sound fade in and fade out. We've already seen this working in the digital audio workstation, where often our fade ins and fade outs are over relatively long periods of time. When we're working with synthesis, we can definitely make fade outs that are and fade in fade ins and fade outs that are really long, but we can also make things that fade in and then decay a little bit and then hold or sustain for some time and then decay the rest of the way. And we can also do these things over very short time spans. And when we, when we control the way that sounds fade in or hold or fade away over very short time spans, we'll discover that, that that also gives very distinctive qualities to the sound. So here's an example um, where what we've done is we've taken our sine oscillator that sounds like this and just goes forever and ever or until I stop it. <laughs> 
and we've multiplied it by an envelope that goes between zero and one and then back to zero. And it takes one second to go from zero to one and it takes one second again to go from one back to zero. So it fades in over one second and it fades out over one second. And that sounds like this. Something quickly fading in and quickly fading out. Maybe not so different from the results we might have expected uh, or results we might get working in the digital audio workstation. But what happens if we take that same sine oscillator and we fade in and fade out over 0 0.05 seconds instead? That's 50 milliseconds. That will sound like this. Like a little blip. But 50 milliseconds, although it's fast, it's still slow enough that it hasn't really changed the character of the sound that much. What if we faded in over five milliseconds and then held at 100% for 50 milliseconds and then faded out over one whole second? So a very quick attack and a short hold and then a really long release. That would sound like this. I'm using a different frequency here too. And if you pay close attention to the beginning of this sound, it has a slightly percussive feel. This particular envelope that we're using that fades in very quickly, holds and then releases, has a kind of bell-like percussive quality to it. This next example takes that a little bit further. It uses an even lower frequency, a 70 hertz sine wave, and it fades in really quickly, and then it holds at a slightly lower volume for a while, um, for a long time actually, and then, and then disappears quickly at the end. And that sounds like this. Five seconds is a bit too long, maybe. I'm gonna change this five second to um, 0.6 seconds, and it'll sound like this. And actually, I think I'm going to not hold for very long and make the release take half a second. There we go. So hopefully you have good headphones on to listen to this and to appreciate the deep bass frequencies of it. This is not so far away from the kind of technique that is used to make the bass drum sound on something like the 808 drum machine. We have something that generates a continuous sound, an oscillator, uh, with lots of low frequencies in it, and then we have an envelope that makes it quickly fade in and not quite as quickly fade away. If I make it fade away really quickly, it'll sound like this. Sounds kind of like a blip now. Let me put just a little bit more hold time back there. Maybe a little bit more, uh, a little bit more. I'm kind of demonstrating one of the ways you experiment with synthesis here, which is to set up a system and then to play with the numbers of it, play with the timings to get different qualities and sounds. Now it has a little bit more bass presence. Again, I can imagine using this as a drum, perhaps, in some kind of music. So um, our final example here in the section on envelopes um, applies an envelope that fades in and fades out in a certain way to a combination of multiple sine oscillators. And we get this result. And the other thing about this example is that it's using envelopes in two ways. There's an envelope that's controlling how the, the sound fades in and fades out. And there's another envelope that's controlling the frequencies. What we're hearing is these frequencies times two, and then it quickly transitions to those frequencies times one instead. And if you listen at the beginning, you hear this kind of glide in the pitch. It goes like, duh, right? So the basic use of envelopes is, and uh, the most common use of envelopes is to control how sounds appear and disappear to control how they fade in and fade out. But we can certainly 
use this idea of something moving in time and apply it to other things like frequencies and get interesting results. Uh, and when we do that, when we do apply our envelope to other things, we're kind of overlapping with another important area of synthesis, the area of modulation, the broader, more general area of modulation. And modulation is whenever we use one unit generator to change or control um, a parameter on another. And it's, this is useful for two reasons. It can create the, the effect of something moving in a certain sense. I've got motion in quotations there because it's like imaginary motion. It's not, the, it's not the motion of things necessarily from left to right that we associate with panning. Um, and it could, but, but modulation can also give us new timbres. So this next series of examples starts to unpack these possibilities a little bit. So in this example, what we have is a sine oscillator uh, and its frequency, instead of being always 440 hertz, goes up and down around 440 hertz, according to another sine oscillator. So it's like another sine oscillator that's moving really slowly is making the frequency of this outer sine oscillator fluctuate between 430 and 450. And that sounds like this. Kind of like a siren or like a singer's vibrato, a particularly mechanical vibrato. And so this is an example of what I mean by an effect of motion. We hear the pitch, but we hear the pitch moving in time. So that's one very straightforward example of modulation. This next example is the same idea. It's just being done to three sine oscillators at once to make things a little bit more complicated. And that's gonna sound like this. So we still hear the motion, but we also hear some interesting little beats that are happening um, as the three oscillators interact with each other at slightly different frequencies. It's kind of an interesting texture. Now in this next example, it's this exactly the same structure. There's one sine oscillator, which is controlling the frequency of another sine oscillator. But now that modulation is happening much more quickly. It's happening 20 times per second instead of one times per second. And that sounds like this. So it still sounds like the sine oscillator, but it has a little, it has a warbling character to it. Or if you listen to it another way, it's almost like you can hear, almost hear two pitches there. And if we keep going with this, if we increase the frequency of, the, of our oscillator that's controlling the frequency of the other oscillator, and we make the oscillate the frequency of the other oscillator vary over an even wider range we get this and if you listen to this sound it it still has the pitch of our original 440 hertz sine wave but it's got a very different timbre it's got a kind of nasal quality to it uh, a, a slightly buzzy quality, perhaps. And if we look at it in the spectrum analyzer, we can see that uh, it's kind of like a mountain that's really wide. Instead of being concentrated on 440, there's some energy at 440, but then it, there's kind of like a spread around that that's, that's larger than what we saw with the sine oscillator. So, you know, we're seeing that when we do modulation with higher frequencies, it can change the timbre of the sounds. It can change how things are distributed around the spectrum to give us different qualities of sound. This next example takes that a little bit further by doing that high speed modulation on a couple of closely related frequencies at once. And it sounds like this. It's kind of a nice deep bass sound, resonant. I can imagine this being used in a 1960s science fiction film as the sound of a powerful computer, perhaps a powerful evil computer. Now this is just, so far we've been working with modulation and we're just like when we were first 
working with oscillators. I'm just making them and I'm letting them run forever. So the final in the final example, um, again, don't worry about how any of this code works. Not really very important right now. Um, what I want you to pay attention to is the the way the different ideas are brought together in the result here. In this final example, we're going to make a synthesizer that has um, some fast modulation of a sine oscillator and then it applies an envelope to it so that it fades in pretty quickly and releases not as quickly so that it has a kind of percussive sound. And I'm going to add that synthesizer to my setup here and when I play it, it sounds like this. So it's kind of a percussive bass instrument with a, a complex timbre. And because, finally, just for fun, because I'm here in a live coding environment, Super Collider, now that I've designed that synthesizer, I can use patterns to make it go. And because we're working with synthesis, whether it's software synthesis or modular synthesis, different types of analog synthesis, now we can tweak the knobs, so to speak. We can change the parameters as the thing runs to get different effects. Maybe some that we like. sound like if I make the envelope decay away much more quickly. I think I'll go back to my original idea, which was something like this. So there's a, a quick exploration of the, the main basic synthesis components or unit generators. We looked at oscillators that produce a regular repeating shape forever and ever. We looked at noise generators, which produce either white noise or pink noise. Basically, they randomly choose values to give us something that spreads through the spectrum. Filters we're already familiar with, but we looked at an, an, an unusual use of filters that is common in synthesis, starting with noise and then using filters to carve out something that has a pitched sound. We looked um, at, in some length at envelopes, which are how synthesis sounds are made to fade in or fade out. And we saw that in addition to using those envelopes to fade in and fade out a sound, we could use those shapes also to affect other parameters. And finally, we saw that when we use one unit generator to change or control a parameter on another, this is the broad idea of modulation. And if we do it in continuous ways, it can create effects of motion, but also new timbres like this pleasing bass sound that we made and then made variations of in a later step. Thanks for listening. See you soon.